Um, uh, well, I'm talking about me right now, but actually it would be possibly the whole campus. Some, some instructor, how many people have instructors that are already going online? Okay, so, all right. Yeah, I mean, we've been asked to do that if we can, okay? I will try, okay. So let me explain what I'm gonna do. I'm going to record a video. If you are not here, I will be here with an empty classroom and I will be recording myself teach you a lecture, okay? I will be here. So, because there's nobody to get me infected, so I'm safe, you know? <laughs> Don't worry about me. Uh, you should worry about yourself though and take care of yourself and be, be really good, diligent, right? Don't touch your face. I'm gonna touch my face probably. Can you yell at me or something? You know, touch your face. Yeah. Question. Um, that's a good question. I think it would be um, probably a little confusing if I do that. The lectures between eight and 9.35 are very similar. So I'll probably do one live stream per day. Every, every lecture, yeah. Actually, I'm kind of like, it's funny. For years, I've like, well, what about all those students who missed my class? How do they get all my fun jokes and everything? And the answer is they don't, you know, they miss them. <laughs> but now I have a way. I'll have recordings of every lecture. You miss a class, you can watch a recording. I'm like, I should have done this years ago. Why didn't you do that years ago? You know, you could be a better teacher. I'm like, yeah, I could be. Yes. <laughs> Oh, let's talk about that later. Okay. I have thought about that though. Okay. So the, the thing is we'll watch the video. If you are not here live, then I have no way to record your participation. So what you'll do is I will make up a quiz to go with each lecture and you'll take that quiz. It will be relevant to the content in the lecture. Okay. So actually in a way it may even be better, right? Than just doing the clicker questions. Cause I'm going to, reflect back on the class and ask you questions directly related to the content. So you'll be getting a great preview for, for the exams that way. Actually, I kind of like it. I, it's really good. And then if I talk too fast or I click the slide too fast, you can just pause the video, right? It really has advantages. The disadvantage is you're not here, you know, sharing the experience together. Question. I'm recording it right now. I'm putting it on YouTube. Oh. Yeah, this moment. You're on YouTube right now. Thank you. You want me to take you out? I'll try to edit you. No, I'm not. I'm just going to not tell you. Yeah. Pardon, one more time. I'm, I, this is what the administration has asked us to do, to try to make an online ability for students to get the information. So there are students right now who are not coming to class. They're worried. and. Um, and maybe it's right, I don't know yet, we don't know, but it may be what we end up doing. So we've been asked to try to do as much as we can online. Okay, there was a question about the exams. I don't know how to do the exams yet. Um, how many people would not cheat if I took it at home? Raise your hand, I wouldn't cheat. <laughs> raise your hand, I'm gonna cheat no matter what. I'm gonna find a way, ah, oh, you raise your hand, okay. I know, it's, it's actually, this is the one problem, right? Is, is an exam that I give you online valid? There are ways to do it. There are ways to do it. I'll look into it. I'm going to be working, you know, if we have to do it, we have to do it. I'm not going to not give you an exam, right? I, I give you an exam, but maybe we can figure out a way to do it. You have an answer? Oh, question. Okay. You know what? There's no easy answer for that. As of this moment, we're still meeting because I cannot actually, I can't virtually run a telescope. I can't. Look at the stars, you know, it's a really difficult thing. Many, many things I can do. I can record a lecture. I can, rec I can quiz you, you know, so we can do some things, but the looking through the telescope part is really not possible remotely. We might have a, I don't know the answer yet. What's that? Yes, the lab, as far as I know. And if you don't hear from me, it's still on and you should come. But the museum could close. Or, you know, we could be told we're not allowed to use the space, right? That could be. Or the school could say you have to go fully online and then we'll have to adapt, all right? So actually, I promise I will do the best job I can to give you what you're supposed to learn. And you do the best you can to learn that information and we'll do the best we can, right? That's all we can do. So be gentle with each other, right? Be gentle with each other. Understand everybody's a little stressed and a little bit worried. Some people more than others. Some people are panicky right now. Anybody? 
Anybody? Okay, so you're you're here. You're probably not right, but there are people who are really convinced that you know if they don't protect themselves, they're going to be in danger. So I'm supposed to go to Hawaii for spring break. I'm so looking forward to Hawaii, but then I just heard a Canadian professor came back from Hawaii with coronavirus. I'm like, oh man, that would. I don't really want to get it. I mean, I'll probably end up getting it, right? I don't know. But would I rather get it in Hawaii? Yes. <laughs> With a piña colada in my hand, you know. I'm going to go to a luau, too. All right. I hope they don't cancel my flight. I don't know, you know. I will do the best we can. If I'm here, I'll be here, you know. I'm going to love my life wherever I am. Okay, babe, how are you doing? Okay. So, um... Are you sitting in a seat? Like, do you want to sit in a seat, though? Yeah. All right. Okay. Oh, I gave you a seat. I gave you a seat. You know where to sit? You don't have to sit there. Okay. What's your seat? Uh, a, F12. Over on that side, F12. You don't need to sit there. Here, you don't need to use that clicker. F, A, B, C, D, E, F, 12. Next to Morgan. You see that guy? Yeah. Yeah, F12. Next to Morgan. The red-headed guy, the reddish hair, the bluish shirt. F F. Okay. Raise your hand. F F eleven. Where are you? F eleven. You're next to him, right here. Okay. Sit like right over there. This one today. Which one? Right to the Asian dude. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. So, anyways, are we ready to get started? Let's do some, actually say good morning to your neighbor. Your neighbor is here. You don't have to touch each other. Just say hi. But you're here. You're here. We're all here. We'll do the best we can. Okay. So, um, should I live stream this? Oh, yeah. I'm live streaming it. Okay. So, one last thing. Sorry. I just realized. Let me do one last thing. I'm going to make an announcement for anybody who's at home. Okay. We're going to try it again. The first one was a fail. This one will be great. Maybe we should test it. Anybody? Should we test it? Second try. Let's try it again. The first time I didn't record sound. This time I think I'm on. It's, I think it should be okay. I think so. And you can watch the recording if you want later, right? What's that? The the tutors, yes, right now today. Yeah. Everything is open until they tell us no. Okay. Okay. So oops. All right. Can you hear anything? Hello? Oh yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Okay. It works. All right. So um. Okay. We're in business. Let's do this. All right. So let's talk about what we need to do. Let's go ahead and I forgot to restart this. Let's do 9:35. Your first clicker point after all that time. Reset. Reset. Okay. And click that clicker. Okay. Okay. So we start off today. Our topic of today is the mission that is known as New Horizons. You want to write that down? New Horizons uh, was launched in 2006 to go travel to the last planet in our solar system, Pluto. In the same, that was January. In July of 2006, the IAU demoted Pluto to a dwarf planet. So actually, everybody was kind of disappointed. It's not the last planet anymore, but it is the last object, the last big object to be examined in our solar system. And so we, for the first time, got to see what it was. What was the prediction 
from the, the planetary scientists. When they got to Pluto, what do they think? It's 30 plus AUs from the sun. It's a small ball of matter. What do you think? Is it going to be alive or dead? They predicted that it would be dead, that it would be smooth and featureless, that it would be boring. They predicted that, but they still wanted to go look at it, right? Which is cool. I like that. Scientists just want to try. Let's go see. And so the prediction was, it's not going to be that interesting, but, you know, let's go take a look, just in case. Good thing, because it turned out to be amazing, right? So it was discovered in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh with a big telescope, the biggest, one of the biggest telescopes in the world, uh, is the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Anybody been there? Raise your hand, I've been there. Oh, yeah, it's cool, right? Did you look through the telescope? Probably not. No, I know, you don't get to look through it. Uh, but anyways, this is the best picture of Pluto that was taken before the New Horizons mission went there, taken by the HST. What's HST stand for? Hubble Space Telescope, right? So if you ever see HST, you know that's the Hubble, and it's everywhere. Hubble pictures are everywhere. And so as you can see, look at the detail on that. That's amazing. Look at that. Nothing, right? What do I see? I see nothing. It's blurry mess. So it's a big difference when you see the pictures up close, right? A really big difference. But we can kind of see some of the features that we saw originally from that picture. So the name of the mission was New Horizons. And the goal was to take pictures and, and analyze the system, the Pluto system, the Pluto and its moons. Discover maybe more moons than we, than we knew about, right? We don't know for sure. How many moons are out there? Uh, we know about the big one, Sharon, but we don't know much about the other little ones. There's some little ones that had been detected. Look for rings, right? And, uh, and see what we can see. So we want to get it out there as quickly as possible. So we launch it in a, in a trajectory that gets it there in just eight years. No, uh, nine years. Nine years. It took nine years. As fast as we can go, right? So does it stop and orbit Pluto when it gets there? What do you think? Not possible. It's not possible to slow down and stop. It's moving so fast. So it's called a flyby mission, right? It's a flyby mission. And so they had to do this whole choreography for how they were going to analyze the planet. As they, they swing by, they want the cameras focused right on the planet and the moon. So they, they programmed the, the mission ahead of time to be able to do this remarkably sophisticated dance and take pictures and, and uh, spectral imaging and all kinds of information, measure magnetic field, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, so it went out to Pluto, and as it went, we started to get the pictures. The pictures came back, and every picture that it took was better than the one before. This was the best picture of Pluto that had ever been taken. You can start to see detail. And every time it took a picture and sent it back, we were seeing the best picture of Pluto that had ever been seen, right, by human eyes. And finally, as it passed Pluto in July of 2015, we saw up close and personal, a beautiful, the best picture right here. So Pluto, um, we saw this picture. It is just 12,500 kilometers, very close to Pluto. Pluto is a small body, just a couple thousand kilometers wide. And we saw this giant heart, right? Everybody remember the heart in Pluto? Because we love it, right? Heart. So what you need to know is the name. Let me tell you the name. I, I didn't put it on the slide. But it's called Sputnik, S-P-U-T-N-I-K, Sputnik, Plenum. Sputnik Plenum, P-L-E-N-U-M. And it is a glacier, a glacier. Who's heard of glaciers, right? We have them on Earth but it's made of nitrogen ice. And it turns out it's the biggest glacier that we have ever seen. So it's the biggest one in the solar system. Yeah, there it is, right? Bigger than anything on earth, 1,200 miles, 2,000 kilometers wide. And so what is a glacier? It's a piece of ice that moves across the surface of the planet. Okay, usually something happens uh, to make them move, right? A temperature gradient of some kind, weathering. Uh, on Pluto, what would make it? Well, Pluto flies on a very elliptical orbit. It's kind of like a comet in some respects, right? So what happens when it's closer to the sun, right? Near perihelion, what happens to Pluto? Well, it heats up. It has more of an atmosphere. As it moves away from the sun, what happens to the atmosphere? 
it falls back down to the surface and solidifies. It turns back into you know, solid material, it ices on the surface of the planet. So we think that the red colored material was once in the atmosphere. We've, we've identified something interesting about that. That red color is a complex organic compound called tholin, which is not a single chemical. It's a whole range of chemicals, but they're long chain carbon compounds. Okay, interesting. So number one, the uh, atmosphere of Pluto is made of nitrogen gas. That's kind of interesting, nitrogen gas. So was Pluto very volcanic at one time? What do you think? Lots of carbon dioxide, right? Did I just say that? No, I did not say that. What did I say? Nitrogen gas, no carbon dioxide, no volcanic activity whatsoever, never, never, okay? So this was not a volcanic body, never, never was. Um, and it does have um, interesting smog. The smog is organic compounds, methane and other longer chain organic compounds. And because of its elliptical orbit, remember it changes atmosphere. So it has a lot of atmosphere close to the sun and not a lot of atmosphere further from the sun. It always has some though, it always has some. So it's a pretty big body. Okay, so it also has methane and carbon monoxide. These are other chemicals. So we're gonna hear those words again uh, when we talk about the ices on the surface, right? The ices on the surface. So we already heard about nitrogen ice, we knew that, but we're gonna hear there's methane ice and carbon monoxide ice as well. Does anybody hear water ice? No, that's interesting, huh? I just remarked on that, I don't know, I was thinking. Okay, so here is a picture of the surface. And what do you see? Is it a boring flat object? And the answer is not at all. Everybody was just dumbfounded. They were just boggled by seeing these pictures because immediately the question is, how did they form? Is this a volcanic planet? Did this form from volcanism? No, not at all. Maybe cryovolcanism, but we don't see evidence of that. It has a fractured surface. It has smooth plains and it has these very, it has mountains. It has mountainous areas. It has funny little weird surfaces that look like really strange. How did they form? What's going on? Um, so anyways, it was just, just rich, lots of variety. This is an interesting body, right? It's a dwarf planet, but it has much more interesting stuff going on than we ever would have predicted. And so lots of scientists are trying to figure out how did they form? What happened? In fact, new PhDs are getting their PhDs by describing and modeling and, and figuring out how the Pluto works. Okay, how does it work? So let me tell you another little thing. They have some planes, but we have um, uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen, and water ice, lots of water ice. In fact, uh, here's an interesting thing. There are these blades like sharp knives that are shooting up into the air uh, or the nitrogen atmosphere. Uh, and they're made of methane, methane ice blades. So have we ever seen anything like this on earth? And the answer is not exactly, not made of methane, first of all. Methane is only a gas on Earth. But the temperature on Pluto is so cold that, in fact, you can have uh, methane as an ice. This is not new. This is 2017. But anyways, it's showing those are the regions with the methane ice, right? So these look like something that we do see on Earth, made of water ice. Okay, so this, this mission is a little bit different from typical robotic missions. Instead of being controlled by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, every other mission is, by the way, this one is controlled by Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Maryland. So this is a little bit different. But anyways, the data is, is online. This is probably one of the best parts right here. The mountains are made of water ice. Okay. Have we heard about this before? Have you heard about a place with water ice mountains? The moon called Titan had that, right? That's kind of an interesting thing. It may be a very common feature in the outer solar system for the water, which never reaches a high temperature, 
to exist like this as a solid. So mountains made of water ice. How did they form? Well, that's still a story that I don't know the answer to. It's still, I don't know. How do you make thousands of feet tall, 3,500 3, meters? They're pretty small compared to earth standards, but they're significant, right? How did you make those? I don't, I'm not sure. I don't really know. So uh, anyways, it's kind of interesting to think about. So this is just a picture, a view from the side. And it's, it's beautiful. It's amazing. It's not at all boring, right? It's full of interesting details. And so that's actually, I, I guess, what I want you to come away with, right? That we're, we're still finding out uh, information and discovering uh, places that we, we thought would be not interesting are really much better than we thought. So we have to figure out why are they so interesting? What makes them alive? This is still alive, in my opinion, right? It has a surface that's being modified and changing over time. That's alive. Okay, so it has moons. You need to know it has five moons. Write down five moons, okay? One of them is really big. It's called Sharon. So Sharon is the big moon. And the other four are pretty tiny. They're really tiny. And actually, take a look at this amazingly detailed picture right here. Everybody pretty happy with the picture? Anybody a little bit disappointed in NASA? Come on, NASA, really? Come on, what's up? Right, you went all that way, and you only all you could do is you went all that way, and all you could take was a fuzzy picture, right? So that's pretty. Well, that's kind of a fail, right there. I, I would say, wouldn't you? Come on, you went all that way. But the answer to the question why is really interesting. It turns out when they predicted the location of the moons and they pointed the camera at that location, the moons were not there. And so, did somebody make a map? error, right? Oops, somebody made a map. No. It turns out that these moons are gravitationally interacting with each other so much that they have what we call chaotic orbits. So you cannot predict exactly where they're going to be. Any little change would, is causing them, gets magnified over time. You can't really predict it very easily. So that's the best we have. And now for a lot, maybe for the rest of your life, actually. That's the best you're going to do. Sorry about that. But they're unpredictable in their nature, right? They, they interact with each other too much. So a little wiggle here, a little wiggle there, they end up in a different place. Okay, so chaotic orbit. So, But the big one, Sharon, we knew exactly, and we have a beautiful picture of Sharon. You'll see it looks different and the same, right? It's very light in color. What does that tell you? High albedo. What kind of surface is a high albedo? Icy? Yes, icy. Lots and lots of ice. Uh, very high albedo. It has a red color too. It has the same chemical compounds that we find on Pluto, right? The same organic uh, compounds. Uh, it has a giant canyon. I don't know the I don't know the name. You don't have to worry about that. It just has an interesting feature. But there is something really important. There's a couple of interesting things. The there's the south part has very few craters. And what does cratering mean? It tells us about what. The age, right? So if it's if there's few craters, what can you say? It's a younger region of the of the moon, right? And then it has the most important thing you need to know is Sharon, as it orbits Pluto, is tidally locked. Who can tell me what that means? Tidally locked. What's it mean? One face, one face of Sharon always faces Pluto, right? Okay, have we heard about this before? Our own moon is tidally locked. No big deal, right? But there's a big deal I didn't tell you about, right? It turns out that Sharon is so big compared to Pluto, like roughly half the size of Pluto, we get to see the first time ever Pluto is tidally locked to Sharon. They're tidally locked to each other. So like two lovers that dance together forever, right? Yeah. Anyways, no, you don't get that. Okay. My wife liked that one. <laughs> I use that on her at night sometimes. Yeah. Anyways, never mind. Okay, so Sharon, <laughs> the lack of ha laughter right here is funny. That's funny. Okay, all right. Anyways, okay. Uh, so Sharon and Pluto are tidally locked to each other. They're locked to each other. So one face of Pluto always faces uh, towards Sharon. Okay. All right. So um, there we go. To scale, you can see similarities. Yeah, question. No, 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 they're just, um, that wasn't necessary. Oh, I don't know, actually. You know what, I don't even know. I can't, I can't tell you the answer. The materials are very similar. So 
the answer to your question is possibly, and I'm sure somebody is trying to figure this out right now based on the size and, and characteristics of the material, try to come up with a model to describe how Sharon uh, was, would, would have formed. But actually, you know, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Yeah. Oh, wait, was the smaller moons? Oh, yeah, the smaller moons. Uh, but I don't know about Sharon. Yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, yeah, it could have been. Yeah, these are potential. Those are obviously, that's one of the possibilities. What are the other possibilities? That Pluto spun apart, called the fission model, or that it was captured, it captured uh, the moons, right? That's, those are all possible. And then you use the data to try to figure out which one gives you the best, best result. Okay, so, um, all right, here we go. First question. What are the mountains on Pluto made of? Okay, if you're at home watching this video, then after I get done with the lecture, I will be putting a quiz up for you so that you can get your participation points as well. So those of you who are here today, if you decide next week that you don't want to be here, um, you can still get your participation points if you watch the video and then take the quiz afterwards, okay? I will, I'll provide, I'll be here. You can come as long as we say that we can, is, we can be here. I'll be here, but you can also get it for being, uh, participating that way. Okay. Is it blocking your view? You know what? Why don't I, I don't need it to be so high open. How about that? That's better, huh? Okay. Yeah, that's good. But I'm trying to, re oh, I can't do that. The camera's right here. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Those of you at home. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Does that have to say something about their, mag their magnetic field or like their tilt? Like, how are why is the significance of them being tidally locked? Oh, so tidally locked actually doesn't mean magnetic field. It means um, that the gravitational field is strong. And this is the part that I, we didn't talk too much about this, but inside of the body, the matter is not uniformly distributed. It has one side that's a little denser than another. And that, that's, that's the reason why tidally locked is happening. But that must be true inside of Pluto as well. So the tidal force from Sharon can tidally lock Pluto. Pluto is tidally locking Sharon, right? They're just tidally locking each other. Okay. All right. Oh, man. I went way too long. Okay. The answer was water ice. Water ice. Okay. Sorry. Carbon monoxide ice is not the mountains. Okay. Water ice mountains. Here we go. Why did the New Horizons mission not go into orbit around Pluto? I think I told you the answer already, but read the questions, right? Read the questions. Okay, read. Okay, so new, read the answer. Sorry. It was launched at a very high speed to shorten its trip. Scientists did not expect Pluto to be interesting, to spend much time there. The spacecraft suffered a malfunction on its way there. Uh, and, and D, it crashed into one of the moons, right? So you should know, I, I don't know if you know this, but it didn't stop at Pluto. It continued on to another object, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, and it's still going. So obviously one of the answers is wrong. Okay, but anyways, keep going. All right, what's the right answer? Why would you not go into orbit? If you could go into orbit, would you? Probably. It would have been cool. It would have been really interesting but they literally couldn't, so. All right, we got it? And the right answer was A, right? You're launched at a high speed, so high that you can't, can't stop yourself, and therefore um, you just fly past as, as the, and take pictures the best you can. But you didn't stop, right? You kept going. In fact, where is it today? Well, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step back in time just a little bit and tell you that it was a little bit tricky to figure out what to look at next. They knew the spacecraft can still do cool science, right? I know it's really dim out there, but this thing is designed to take pictures of very dim objects. And so the scientists were like, let's find another object. We wanna take more pictures and, and analyze stuff. And so they looked and after a while they found an object called MU69. 
And then we gave it a name. The name originally was Ultima Thule. I'll write that down in a second. And now has been given an official designation, uh, which is called Arakoth. Okay. So actually it went on. Here it comes, Arakoth. Okay. So you write that down. You need to know this. This has changed since I last taught the course. The official name came out. So that has to change on the study guide, by the way. It's not called Ultima Thule anymore. It's called Arakoth. Okay. You need to know the actual name. And this is the next object that it went to after Pluto. So here's a little video clip showing how hard it is to see anything out there. And it took them actually at first, uh, I think this is a technique they use, is the camera is slightly out of focus to allow them to actually track some kind of dot. But they're looking for something that has parallax, right? We see parallax when it shifts position. That means it's relatively, and now you can start to see it, right? Now they know they're getting closer to this object and they can start tracking and, and finding a way to get to it. And now you'll start to see it. Here it is, more and more detail until we finally get the best picture that we've ever seen of a Kuiper Belt object other than Pluto. There it is. And that's an artifact. There's no satellite. That was not real. That's not real. Okay. Artifact of the data processing. Okay, there it is. Woo! Okay, I know, not as exciting, <laughs> but it's what it is. So this little, this thing that we see, here's the, here's a picture that has been, they took all, a composite picture, all of the data and the spectral imaging. This is meant to reflect the actual color that you would see if you could go visit this object. So it's kind of a brownish color, kind of brownish something. And the features, that unfortunately is not going to get much better than that. So it's so dark out there that it doesn't reflect a lot of light. This is a small object. Actually, how big is it? It's about um, 30 kilometers, the whole thing. The whole thing is only 30 kilometers wide. So these are really tiny. So you're not gonna be able to see a lot of uh, detail, unfortunately. But it is kind of interesting. And um, there's uh, one more picture showing a little bit three-dimensional. So do you notice, first of all, it has two pieces to it? And it turns out we now believe this might be incredibly common. Yeah, right. How did it form? You can imagine there were really two pieces. And then what? Did they smash together in a violent collision or kind of a soft little bump? Which one? It had to be a soft little bump. If it was violent, what would happen? They would shatter each other into pieces. But obviously, once in a while, they bumped together and they heated the ice and they formed a little neck between them. We saw this with the comet mission, Rosetta mission to churyumov gerasimenko was very similar. Uh, the interesting thing, I just want to share a little detail. I'm a member of a group called IOTA, which is the International Occultation and Transit uh, uh, Association. And we watch for events in the sky that have been predicted where an object will pass in front of a star and block the light of a star. It's called an occultation. And if you are standing on Earth watching that, you can videotape it. You are in the shadow of that object. And we actually, I was not a member of, uh, of the committee that did this or the group that did this, but a number of people were able to, to stand and watch the occultation of this object from Earth and figured out that it had two pieces before we ever got there. And so this is actually really encouraging because we didn't know for sure how good the data was, like whether or not this technique is really working. So if enough people stand on the earth and watch the occultation, then they will be making the outline of the shadow and we can infer the shape of the object. It's pretty exciting. I know you might be like, whatever, but it is, it's kind of cool. Yeah. How do we know that it's not being pulled apart as well? Okay, so while well, gravity pulls things together, what pulls things apart is when they are in orbit around a large mass, right? Then the tidal force would tend to pull them apart. So otherwise, gravity just pulls things together. Yeah, that's how we know for sure, right? But if it was in orbit around another body, then the answer is it probably would get pulled apart. Yeah, the tidal forces would rip it apart uh, if it's too close. So where is it now? It turns out you can go look. Um, actually, I took this picture this morning. It's beyond Arakoth, right? And they're looking for something else, a candidate to fly past and take another picture. Uh, you can actually click on this link. Uh, it takes you to the John Hopkins University uh, Applied Physics Laboratory and then find out, you know, stuff. So we, um, it's over a year now since we passed by and the mission has been going for 
a lot of days, right? <laughs> Since 2006, right? And they just keep going and more information. So anyways, there's lots of lots more information. We're not going to cover everything. But there you go. That's a little bit of a detail on the New Horizons mission that you have to know about, okay? So that's it. And they have a Twitter, at NASA New Horizons. Uh, right now, it's not as active, but it was super active when they were publishing new, new results. Okay, so now we get to talk about our sun. Not that one. Here we go. Chapter 10. You'll notice that we skip chapter 9. Not that I don't like chapter 9, but I like chapter 10 and later chapters better. And I had to choose, and that was my choice. Chapter 9 is about life in the universe, and it's really interesting if you want to just look through there. It won't be tested or anything, so it's up to you. Uh, but there is some interesting information there. I actually really like it, but again, I like this stuff better. So we're going to talk about the sun. What is the sun? Anybody? The sun is a star, of course, a star. And what are stars? Well, that's actually what we're about to study, right? What are stars? How do they work? What makes them live, right? What makes a star live? And I'm getting a message to restart my computer. No, let's not do that. Uh, so stars are alive. Actually, um, over here I have a little picture. And I actually, I really like to draw this picture. Can you draw this picture in your nose? A star is alive, right? And you're going to draw a circle, draw a circle for it to represent the star. So what force formed the star in the first place? What force? The force of gravity caused the cloud of material to collapse, right? And it, it had a lot of potential energy, but when it collapsed, what happened to the potential energy? It turned into kinetic or thermal energy. It was a hot ball called a protostar. And when the star is alive, the gravity is pulling in. Does gravity actually eventually stop pulling? Anybody? Does gravity stop pulling? One day, maybe? No, never. Sorry. Gravity just keeps pulling. How long? Until it finally kills the star. So the star is going to die one day, right? Unfortunately, that's life, right? That's life. Life and death, right? Okay. Uh, a star will eventually die. Gravity never stops. But as long as the star is alive, there is a force to stop gravity. And that actually is a key thing. So we have a name for this. And I haven't told you the name of the force yet. Let's wait on that. But the idea is called hydrostatic equilibrium. Okay. So today, one of the things we want to understand is what is it that stops gravity? What is the name? What is the identity of the force that must be stopping gravity? And you'll notice the word is equilibrium. So I'm going to ask a question and you should try to understand what the answer is. If this force is pushing against gravity, is it stronger, weaker, or the same strength as gravity? Which one does it have to be? The same. That's right. Because, actually, you can think about it. And as a matter of fact, during the life of a star, they will not always be equal. That's actually important. We're going to talk about that, right? But as long as the star is alive, they are equal, okay? What happens, by the way, if gravity is stronger? What happens if gravity is stronger than this other force? What will happen to the star? Will it get bigger or smaller? Which one? The star will get smaller. It will compress. What happens if the inside force, whatever that is, is bigger than gravity? What will happen? The star will expand. So the star that is our sun is going to do both of these things in its life. And we need to understand that. But as long as it's enjoying its middle life, its regular life, these, these forces are balanced, exactly balanced. Okay. So actually, I'm going to just tell you the name right now. What's the name? What is the secret identity, right? Who watches the, the voice? Anybody watch the voice? No? Do you know what I'm talking about? Isn't it called the voice? The mask thing? Oh, the mask. It's called the mask. What is it called? There's two, there's oh, I'm getting confused. See, I don't watch it. I just saw it like one time. What's the one where you put a, he a helmet on, right? The mask? The mask? Okay. So who's the secret celebrity behind the mask, right? I've never, ever used that line ever before. You guys are my first. Did it work? No, it's not. Okay. Not good. Okay. What's the name of our secret force here pushing against gravity? And is it stronger or weaker or the same strength? Exactly the same, right? It balances gravity. The name of our secret 
contributor is radiation pressure. Hey, write that down. You definitely need to know that. Radiation. What's radiation? Who knows what radiation is? Radiation. Conduction, convection, radiation. What's radiation? Another name for radiation. Hello, anybody? Light. Thank you. Light. Light pressure. The pressure of light. Did you know that light can exert pressure? Anybody know this? Raise your hand. I've heard of this before. Who's heard of a solar sail? Raise your hand. I've heard of that. This is an idea, but it works. It's been tested. A giant mirror that you put out there in space, and the sunlight reflects off of it and pushes the spacecraft. Not kidding. Isn't that crazy? We might have colonists that get to Mars using a solar sail. Oh, my God. It's hilarious. Oh, I love it. Anyways, okay. Radiation pressure. Okay. The pressure of light. Okay, wow. Let me start talking about the sun. Okay. I, I just already started talking about the sun. Oh, wait a second. I just realized. I really, this is my class. I get to do whatever I want. Anything. In fact, to be goofy sometimes. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen that. So I actually want to start you off today when we talk about the sun without a, without a boring PowerPoint. Oh, I did the wrong thing. Okay. Wrong. I got to be on this computer. I forgot. Uh, <laughs> almost ended the live stream. Instead of a boring PowerPoint, let's start off today with a song. Are you ready? So I actually want to go to YouTube and find a good song. And the name of the, son, the song is right there. The sun is a mass of incandescent gas. Would you write that down maybe? And then go look it up later and then learn it and then come up here and sing it with me next time. Okay. So let's try to understand what is the word? What is the word? What's the word in there that you might not know? Anybody? Incandescent. I need you to know that word. What does the word incandescent mean? The sun is a mass of incandescent gas. What does it mean? Anybody know? Incandescent. By the way, a light bulb with a little wire inside of it is called an incandescent bulb. That's actually the technical term for it. Light bulb, incandescent bulb. What does it mean? Glowing, glowing from the heat. That's what it means. Incandescent, glowing from the heat. The temperature of it, it's glowing because it's hot. Okay? Obviously, the sun is glowing because it's hot. Remember, we learned about black bodies, right? The glowing sun is a black body. All right. So actually, I have, I have a couple of versions, and it's very important that you pick the right one. This one up here is really fun, but it's modern. I don't know about that one. You know, I'm going to play that one later. Hold on. We're going to start with the original. This is the original. This is the real deal right here. This is the original. And this is the one that I learned when I was a kid. I learned this as a kid. And hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And the words are right here on the screen. So, okay, so you can sing along with it if you want. It goes a little slower. Ready? The sun is. Oh, I forgot. Oops. <laughs> The mass of incandescent gas, a gigantic nuclear furnace where hydrogen is built into helium at a temperature of billions of degrees. Yo ho, it's hot, the sun is not a place where we could live. But here on Earth, there'd be no life without the light it gives. We need its light, we need its heat, we need its energy. Out of doubt, without the sun, be you and me. I messed it up, okay. Sun is a mass of incandescent gas, a gigantic nuclear furnace, where hydrogen is built into helium. At a temperature of millions of degrees. The sun is hot. How hot? It is so hot that everything on it is a gas. Iron, copper, aluminum, and many others. The sun is large. If the sun were hollow, a billion Earths would fit inside. And yet, the sun is only a middle-sized star. The sun is far away. About 93 million miles away. 
That's why it looks so small. Okay, so I'm going to stop it right there. You can go watch the rest of it if you want. But I just want to share with you that that video, uh, that song I learned when I was a kid. Um, and I, I really think it's kind of fun. And it made me love the sun. I love the sun. There's a couple of really important bits of information you need to know. How does the sun work? What is going on inside of the sun? And the key thing to understand is the sun is this big element creating machine, uh, an atom smashing machine, an atom fusing machine, actually, is a better way to say it. Inside of the sun, the most important mechanism that you need to know is hydrogen is built into helium, right? Hydrogen fuses and forms helium inside of the sun. And so if you look on the periodic table, hydrogen is element number one. What's element number two? Helium, right? You fuse atoms or nuclei together and you build larger nuclei and in the process release energy, right? This is kind of amazing. Um, it's also very far away. Oh, what was the temperature? Did anybody hear the temperature? Millions of degrees. Kelvin, can you write down the core temperature of the sun right now? Is 15 million Kelvin in the core of the sun. Actually, over here, I'm going to write something down. The sun is considered to be a main sequence star. A main sequence star is a star which hydrogen is fusing into helium in the core of the star. The sun is a main sequence star. It is fusing hydrogen into helium in the core. Here's another little thing that you want to know. Every star begins as a main sequence star. Every star. Why? Right? Anybody want to give me an answer for that? All right, we'll come back to that. Think about that for a moment. Why? Okay, so now let me keep going with the musical part. Okay, so the first version was cool, and then a band came, uh, uh, a band, they might be giants. Anybody heard of them? They might be giants. They, I used to listen to them in high school or after high school, but they, they got older, they had kids, and then they said, let's make an album for kids about science. And they made a bunch of science music. By the way, I love every single one of their songs. Some of them are about biology and chemistry, so I'm not going to play them for you. But there's one called Meet the Elements. I love it. It's so cute. Oh, God. It's so cute. Elephants are made of elements. I'm serious. you got to watch that. But anyways, um, Meet the Elements. I'm not kidding. You will be a little bit happier if you watch it. But they came out with another version of the song. And they pepped it up. They made it a little bit you know, faster and peppier. So here it is. Same song, and played by a different band, right? Let me see. The only problem is the, I don't know if the lyrics are working, though.
Oh, it's too late now. Huh? Okay, now do I have sound? Yeah, now it's working. Okay, great. Did it start, I wonder? I think at the... Your thing is blinking. Maybe that's why, huh? Was it blinking before? There's volume now? Thank you, thank you. Okay. There was volume when we started, right? I chested it. Huh? Okay. This is why we're practicing. Yes, this doesn't count today. You guys are here, but maybe next week I'll have it right. Okay, so uh, what are the two forces that are in, in equilibrium inside of a star? Radiation pressure pushing out and gravity pulling in. Which one's bigger? Trick question. What's the answer? They're equal. They're balancing each other, right? All the, all the words are just whatever. There we go. Okay, that, it was just words. Don't worry about it. I already talked all those words. Okay, now, this is a really interesting little, little idea that you want to be aware of. The sun is rotating. Number one, you need to know that. The sun is rotating. By the way, which direction is the sun rotating? The same direction that the planets are going around the sun. The same direction that the earth is rotating. The same direction, right, that the moons are going around. Conservation of angular momentum. Same idea, right? Because we formed from the same cloud of material that was swirling in that direction. That's how we got it, right? The interesting thing part, the interesting part of this is called differential rotation. The rotation of different parts of the sun is different times, okay? So unlike the Earth, by the way, if you're standing anywhere on the Earth, how long does it take to make one, one rotation? 24 hours, right? North Pole, equator, wherever you are, Santa Barbara, 24 hours. On the sun, which is made of plasma, it turns out it mixes and rotates at different speeds, right? Different periods. So the equator is the fastest at just 25 days. And at the pole, it takes almost 35 days. So it's a function of latitude, right? Depending on your latitude on the sun, you, you have a different period. So the fastest is at the equator. And then as you go north or south, it gets longer, okay? Now that's interesting, it turns out, that it does something to the sun's magnetic field, which we will talk about next class. It's really cool, actually really interesting. All right, so now, what is it, what, what's next? What's inside, right? Let's take a look. We have layers in the sun, and you have to know the names of the layers and what's going on. Uh, in fact, what energy transport mechanism is important in that particular layer? So we start off, let's go to the middle of the sun. It's called the core. What's going on in the core? Fusion is going on, right? And what does the fusion do? It releases energy in the process of fusion. We're going to discuss that next class. But somehow the energy comes out. Actually, I do need to tell you how it comes out. I need you to know something. It comes out in the form of light. And so would you please write down, the fusion produces high... Actually, does anybody know the name of the highest frequency, highest energy light on the electromagnetic spectrum? What is it called? Gamma rays. Very good. Write that down. Fusion produces gamma rays. Now, does anybody have a gamma ray light bulb at home? Anybody? It's so fun. I like to sit in front of the gamma ray light bulb sometimes when I'm bored. Anybody think that would be good for you, humans? Do you know what it would do to your DNA, anybody? Just shred it. Shred it. Not, no, no, no. Not, not give you a few genetic defects. It would shred your DNA material. You would die, okay? So raise your hand. I like gamma rays from the sun. No, you don't. Okay. So as a matter of fact, we don't want the gamma rays, but here's the cool thing. The sun said, I'm not letting those out anyways, right? The gamma rays that are produced in the core can't get out. They get absorbed by the material that's around the core. And actually, when they get recreated, they get recreated with a lower energy. And this is amazing. It turns out that the original photon, the gamma ray that came out of the fusion event, will take the energy will take 100,000 years to make it to the surface. Isn't that amazing? It's so dense and so hard to pass through, it takes 100,000 years. And by the time it leaves, it's not a gamma ray anymore. What is the light that we see from the sun? Mostly what? Mostly visible light, which is not so dangerous. So the sun is kind of protecting us 
from those gamma rays by its outer layers. But really, this is why you have radiation pressure. So what's trying to get out? The gamma rays are trying to get out, and they're being blocked. And by being blocked, they build up pressure, which works against what force? Oh, you got a question? Huh? You go, what's it? Yeah. You're just stretching. Okay. I'm just stretching my hand in the air, and I know what you're talking about. Yo, yo. Oh, uh, all right, here we go. So gamma rays are, can't get out. They build up the pressure. That's where the radiation pressure is coming from. Okay, so we have a radiative zone. What's going on there? What, what form is the, is the energy taking in that, in that zone? It's radiation trying to get out, but it can't, right? Outside of that, the sun has showed us the most effe uh, the efficient mechanism for moving energy is not by radiation, but by convective zone, right? So what is convection? We know what convection is? The circulation of a convective fluid, right? And how does it work? Like in the mantle of the earth, what happens? Some of the silicate mantle material gets hot, expands so that its density is less. And what does it do? It rises, it cools, and falls back down again. This is how it works, right? The less dense material rises and then falls back down. So in the sun, what would it be? Hot. Plasma, electrons are free, right? I'm just making that up, but it's hot plasma, rises, releases energy, and falls back down as cooler plasma. I know it's crazy, but this is true, okay? And then finally, what do we see? So by the way, the convective zone goes all the way to the top uh, of the sun, all the way to the surface that we see. We see the top of the convective zone, and the light comes from that part. We call it the photosphere. By the way, would you please write down, what is the surface temperature of the sun, in case you forgot? Same as the core of the earth, 6,000 Kelvin. 15 million in the core, 6,000 on the surface, Kelvin, right? 6,000, it's a big change in temperature. That's where the pressure is coming from. Okay, so the photosphere is what we actually see. If you look at the sun, the light that comes from the sun. Photo means light, light sphere, right? The light's coming out of the sphere. Now, if you could see it, and actually, um, if you remember the eclipse video with the BBC uh, announcer, she had the lovely accent. Anybody remember that one? She, she talked about, oh, I think we see the chromosphere, you know, lovely accent. But anyways, what you're seeing is the atmosphere around the sun. What's the primary component of the atmosphere of the sun? What element is found more than any other? Hydrogen. And what color is hydrogen gas when you excite it? And the answer is pink. So the color of the chromosphere is pink from the hydrogen that's in it. It's actually red, but red plus white makes pink, right? Red plus white. So chromosphere is pink. And finally, there's a final layer that stretches way out. We can't see it except during an eclipse called the corona, right? Very high temperature, by the way. A million Kelvin for the corona, the temperature of the corona. Very low density, million Kelvin. Could you have time for one question? Yeah, one question. Okay. Skip that. Okay, here we go. The place where all the star's energy is produced is that? And we'll go ahead and call that a day after this question. Have a great weekend. Thank you for the sound problem. I guess I have to do it again. Just for part of it? We'll fix that. I have to start looking at that thing, seeing when the sound goes out. Okay. I wonder if this thing warns me. Seems like it might. Have a good weekend. Bye. 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 See you later. Have a good day. Thank you, Gabe. Thanks for taking care of that. Good. Wait, miss the test on Tuesday? Um, you gonna come with me, or do you know where you can take a little break? I need a few minutes. Um, do you know where the the, the Gateway Center or the or the ECC four is? Where the tutors are? Sorry, go to where the tutors are, and I'll be there in just a few minutes. Do you have a pencil? Okay. Hi, I was wondering, is plasma gaseous at all? I'm so confused. Which one, plasma gaseous? Some of it is actually, but it, don't worry, most of it is not. So gas means neutral, means the electrons are bound to the nuclei. Plasma means the electrons are free. They've been ripped off of the atoms.
And so you don't have anything that's neutral anymore. It's just made up a bunch of positives and negatives whizzing around. And the, the force that dominates positive and negative stuff is the electromagnetic force, right? So the idea is that this is going to be as big or more important than gravity, right? Because it's such a huge thing. The force of electromagnetism is much stronger than the force of gravity in general. So that's actually why we're able to, you know, anyways. What was that? Oh, yeah, close it. Uh, the answer was? Of course, A. Yes, of course, A. Sure. Oh, okay. So you're going to go on the trip. Yeah. April 19th. Yeah, you could have done this the day of, but that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. No, no. Huh? Are you going to watch it? Yeah. No, I actually have another one. I can hold on to it. Okay. And if I, yeah, I will have it for you. Thank you. It's not really half. No, no. It's like 99.99999% plasma. Which is a liquid? Or like no, a no, not liquid. No, no. It's not a gas, a liquid, or a solid. Oh. It's, it's like a gas. Okay, it's like a gas. The closest thing is gas. Yeah. But now take those atoms, the original atoms, and rip electrons off of them. Now you have a plasma. So you, it's not gas anymore because gases just kind of bump off of each other. Hey, what's up, dude? Not much, you know, bouncing off. They're neutral, right? But when you have charge, they really react with each other strongly. Kind of like why the ion tail is so straight in a comet, right? Because the solar wind is electric. So when things are electric, there's extra force there that wasn't there when they were neutral. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's that's the key. The reason it was wrong, this, the original song was the gas. It should have been plasma. So, so mostly... Plasma like our, in our blood, like, that's a like different our kind of plasma. Yeah, so that's unfortunate not, that we use the same word. You have to be able to keep that straight. Okay. Yeah, so it's not the same as the plasma in our blood. Okay. It's a different state of matter. And it means take an atom and rip some electrons off. And so what you have is a mix. It, it's... Um, it's not really stable unless you're pumping energy in, you know, then I guess it's kind of stable. It's, I mean, we can make it, we make it all the time. We make it all the time. So it's being used as a useful, there's something called the plasma cutter. It's pretty neat. Actually, have you ever heard of that? No, so cool. Lightning, actually a lightning bolt is an example of plasma. Huh? Lightning bolt is plasma. What is it? And fire too. And fire, exactly. Well, fire some, something, only the visible part. Yeah, you're right. But yeah, it, so fire, yeah, the part that's visible is actually plasma too, yeah. Thank you. Sure, bye. I can't do that. The test. The test, okay. So I need a couple minutes, but okay. do you know where we're going? Is ECC4. Is that the same as the, the tutoring center? Yeah. Oh. Go there and wait for me, and I'll okay. be there in like cool. 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, actually, I was going to kind of offer it to help with the live stream stuff because I do. All oh, the, all the well, time. that would be awesome. Do you have some advice for me? or? Uh, yeah, I think a pro program is to use time to get all better. And okay. Like, you can show you like uh, what your audio is. And, like, just, oh, like, maybe that's what I should be using so that I don't screw that up in the future. <laughs> yeah, that would like, be awesome. I've done the same thing too. Like, I'll do a whole program for a while. Then it's like, oh, I, did, I did the whole thing. Yeah. The first one, and I forgot to turn on the mic. But then I did. Yeah. So right now, I do have a, like a to study for my next class. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. But maybe you could come and see me. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, it'd be awesome. I'll be around later. Um, uh, actually, I'll be around later. Or send me an email, and we can make some time. That'd be awesome. Thank you for that. Thank you. You too, man. Okay, I better end the stream. Okay. What can I do for you?